You can learn it. You can practice it. You can get better at it. Being creative becomes a way of life. So, let's talk about how to do that. The first step is for you to learn the nuts and bolts of your craft. When people first come into the industry, we often feel like a cog in a big machine. We thought that this was going to be a big, glamorous uh, thing that we're doing, and it turns out that we're just touching a little tiny piece of the game. Uh, and we didn't realize how much grunt work there goes, there is into making a game. But at this time in your career, this is the time to start learning your craft. Um, when you think of some of the, the big names in our business, uh, many, many of them started uh, as a cog in the machine. Steve Moretzky is a friend of mine who started at Infocom as an unpaid tester. And then 10 years later, he's on the cover of gaming magazines as a gaming god. So when you start off, he spent his time learning his craft at Infocom. So this is the time for you to lay your foundations of your career. Malcolm Gladwell has said that it takes 10,000 hours for anyone to become an expert in their field, whether it's Bobby Fischer uh, in chess or the Beatles playing in Hamburg for several years before they went back to, to England. It takes those 10,000 hours in order to be uh, successful. There's a story of a Chinese emperor who went into the studio of his uh, uh, court artist and he said, I'd like you to make me a painting of a rooster. And the court artist said, okay, it'll take me three years. Come back in three years, I'll have your rooster. The emperor says, okay, goes off. Three years later, he comes back, comes into the studio and the artist is sitting there in front of a blank canvas, sipping a cup of tea. Uh, and the emperor gets mad. And he says, where's my, where's my rooster? And the, and the artist goes, oh, okay. And he makes a beautiful painting, three minutes, beautiful painting of a rooster. And so now the emperor is even more angry. He says, I paid you all this money. I waited three years. Why, if, why couldn't you just have done that? And so the artist opens up the door to the inner part of his studio and out tumbles tens of thousands of drawings of rooster claws and rooster beaks and rooster feathers and everything. And the artist said, if I hadn't had those three years of learning and labor and working on this, I could never have stood here and made this painting for you right now. So the point is that you don't become magically good at being creative. It's something that you have to work at. And at the beginning, this is frustrating because there's this thing that you want to do and yet you feel that you can't do it. You don't have the skill to do it. There's a great series of um, YouTube videos from Ira Glass, who uh, works for NPR in the United States, uh, and his series is on storytelling. And he talks about in the fact that early in his career, he could, he could tell that he wasn't doing it right. And he said, why can't I do it right? And, and he studied what other people were doing, and he finally came to realize that the gap between being able to do it right, uh, not being able to do it right, and being able to do it right, that very gap, the fact that you recognize that gap is something that will one day allow you to overcome that gap. He calls it taste. When you see something and you look at your work and you go, it's not quite right, but I, I know if I could just do this or that, I'll make it right, that's taste. And when you have that, you will get someplace. The people who think that they can just become an expert, walk in the door and be the expert without doing the work, those are the people who will never bridge that gap. So take heart. If you are feeling like you can't do that work, learn your craft. Use your time in this, in, in this position to use the professional tools that are around you, collaborate with the other professionals who are there, uh, make the best possible game that you can, and also use this time to figure out, while you're working on that particular game, to figure out, is this the kind of game that I actually want to make? Because that's where you start. You have to work on something. But as you work on that, you might decide that there are different kinds of games that you might want to work on, different kinds of studios that you might want to work in. 
There's an analogy I like to make to uh, working, uh, playing in an orchestra. In any symphony orchestra, there are about 35 violins. And so if you're one of those 35 violinists, you're an accomplished person, but your violin isn't really heard, your one violin isn't really heard, but if you want to make that kind of beautiful orchestral music, that's what you have to do. Now, maybe you love doing that, and that's okay. But maybe you uh, want your individual voice to be heard a little bit more. So maybe there's a different kind of music you could play. Maybe you could be in a quartet or have a solo career where you're, it's just you and your instrument, you and your violin, and, uh, and there's nobody else to tell you what to do. So there's a direct uh, analogy of correlation to our own business. You might start as a 3D modeler or whatever, and you might say, well, what I really, I really like actually animating more than that, or I really like concept art, or really my goal is one day to actually not make the art myself, but to become an art director and wave the baton of the director of the orchestra, direct this art team in order to do, uh, make a wonderful product, even though I'm not the one actually making the art. So the point of all that is to say, learn your craft. Start with the nuts and bolts of what you're doing. And in our industry, especially now, there are lots of opportunities to work for big companies, for small companies, for studios of all sizes, and even to become an independent. So if the first step is to become grounded in your craft, what comes next? The second step is to learn more about who you are. Now, a lot of people have studied the traits of the creative personality. There's a psychologist named Gregory Feist who says that creative people are generally open to new experiences. They're non-conventional. They're self-confident. They're self-accepting. They're driven. And they're ambitious. This is a tough name to pronounce. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi uh, is known to a lot of game developers for his work in Flow, and we'll talk a little bit about Flow later. But he, also, he spent 30 years studying creative individuals and figuring out what, what tr their traits are, what makes uh, a, a creative in individual different from other folks. And I'll read one of his quotes here. Creative individuals are remarkable for their ability to adapt to almost any situation and to make do with whatever is at hand to reach their goals. If I had to express in one word what makes their personalities different from others, it's complexity. Sixcent Mihaly has identified several seemingly contradictory traits that creative people seem to hold within themselves at the same time. So creative people have a great deal of physical energy, but they're also often quiet and at rest. They work long hours with great concentration, but they project this aura of freshness and enthusiasm. So even though they work really long hours, they always, you always come to them, it's like they're always on. Creative people tend to be smart in some areas, yet naive in others. They tend to have a, kind of a childlike view of many, many things in the world. Creative people, interestingly, alternate between two very opposite ways of thinking. And we're going to talk a little bit about this as we go along. Convergent thinking and divergent thinking. Convergent thinking seeks a single best solution to a problem very quickly. So it's useful for a mathematical problem or something where there's a rote way to solve something. Divergent thinking entertains multiple possible solutions. Divergent thinking allows you to come up with a lot of different ideas that might solve a problem, to switch perspectives or frames of reference. So often what happens is creative people, they practice divergent thinking to come up with a bunch of different ideas and then convergent thinking to say, all right, which one of these is actually useful? Creative people combine playfulness and discipline. So they'll mess around, they'll have fun, but when the time comes, they can knuckle down and, and actually do the work. 
They alternate between wild imagination and practical realism. They have these fanciful ideas, but again, focus on whether something can actually be done or not. Creative people tend to be both introverted and extroverted, which I think is really interesting because that's one of the single most dominant measurable traits of, of anybody is whether they're an introvert or an extrovert. And you can see that in our business, in the game industry, you want both. You want somebody who can be introverted and have the reflective thought that will come up with a creative idea, but then you need extra, to be extroverted to work with teams to collaborate on our projects so that we can all get something done together. So finding people who are both introverted and extroverted is a kind of a tough thing. Creative people are both rebellious and conservative. They're conservative in that they absorb the norms of their culture. They understand what's around them. They're rebellious in that they then create something that goes against those, those norms. They push boundaries to create something that's new. And most pe uh, creative people are uh, passionate about their work, but they can also be objective about it. They can also judge it. They can also have an informed opinion about whether they're, they're work, doing good work or not. And because there's often no objective way to judge a person's creativity or creative work, they're often exposed to suffering and pain. We'll also talk about it, that at the end. Sinkset Mihaly concludes that people seem to be made up of contradictory extremes. He says that a creative person almost doesn't seem like an individual, but a bunch of people inhabiting one body. And this idea of multiple personalities inside one body is echoed by a bunch of other writers. Uh, so uh, Roger Van Eck, for example, says that in every creative person, there's an explorer who goes out and finds new ideas. There's the artist who makes something out of those ideas. There's the judge who sits back and says, is, are these ideas any good or not? And then there's the warrior who goes out and uh, implements those ideas uh, and uh, uh, fights to defend them. There's a, a psychologist uh, named Brian Bates, no relation to me, who's a professor in England, who made a study of widely acclaimed creative architects. And they found that they had several traits in common. And his, his most two common, um, his two important findings is that creative people are playful and that they delay decisions. So it's, the part about delaying decisions is really very interesting. Most people, when they're confronted with a problem, will jump at the first solution that uh, presents itself. And when they say, okay, the problem's solved, then it's like, oh, good. This is solved, I don't have to worry about it anymore. When an experienced creative can tolerate the mental discomfort and the dissonance of living with unresolved problems, one of the things that I do that frustrates teams that I work with the most when they come to me with a problem, I often say, you know what? That's a problem we don't need to solve yet. I know you're thinking about it, but there are other problems that are, there are other things that are more foundational, things that we have to work out first. And doing that work over there will one day allow us to make decisions over here. Right now, we don't have to make this, this decision. We don't have to decide whether this guy is going to be big or small or whether the uniform's red or blue or that sort of thing. At some point, the game will tell us, okay, now it's time to make that call. So if you've learned your craft and you understood uh, that you have to accept and even cultivate these seemingly contradictory aspects of your personality, what comes next? And the, the third step is to understand what motivates you. And this next stuff is useful for creative people to know. It's useful for you to know because if you don't know what you need, how will you know what to ask your managers for or how to plan your own life? And of course, if you're managing creative people, uh, you might want to pay attention to this stuff as well. So back to Ma Malcolm Gladwell. I'm not doing something that's easy or trivial. This is, this is hard work, and, it's, and it feels good to do hard work and to be successful at doing hard work. And then purpose or meaning, a connection between the effort you're expending and the reward uh, that you value 
whatever that reward might be. So let's talk about some of those rewards. Teresa Emmobile is a professor at the Harvard Business School who studies creativity in industrial environments. And she differentiates between intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. Intrinsic motivation is an internal desire to be better at your job, to gain knowledge and skills that will make you better at something that you already like to do. Extrinsic motivation are desires to get a reward that's unrelated or external to your job. So if you're in school, that's basically the difference between studying something because it's really interesting to you or studying something in order to get a good grade. That's the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic. And so she's done interesting studies. And according to, uh, to her, uh, extrinsic rewards actually inhibit creativity. When people feel that they're doing something in order to just satisfy somebody else's goal, they actually aren't as good at, at it. But if intrinsic motivation is high, if we're passionate about what we're doing, then creativity will flow. And this is a famous example of this. This was an experiment done in the 1950s where people were presented with this box of tacks with candle, a uh, box of matches, and the instruction was attach the candle to the wall in such a way that the wax won't drip down on the table. When people were offered a reward of money for solving this, they actually performed more slowly than people who were pre presented this as an interesting, just an interesting problem. And hundreds of studies, not with candles and tacks, but across all kinds of different circumstances, for the last 50 years have verified this over and over again, that extrinsic rewards are much less effective than intrinsic rewards. The solution to this, by the way, is to empty the tax, to think of the box in a different way. Don't think of it as something that's containing the tax. Empty the box out, tack the box to the wall, put the candle in, and then light it. So let's look at a few intrinsic rewards. What, what can we do for ourselves and as managers to help creative people feel good about the work they're doing? Well, it turns out that working in an atmosphere where we feel we're appreciated, we want to know that we're respected for our contributions. Being allowed permission to experiment in areas of personal interest. Google's famous for that one day a week where they said you can work on whatever you want. It was very effective. Uh, getting rewards that feed back into doing the jobs that we like to do that enable us to do them better. So for example, um, uh, artists, for example, might uh, appreciate the company doing uh, live figure drawing classes or study, life studies classes. Programmers, what does a programmer want? What he wants is a high-end machine that will allow him to do his work. He wants two monitors, not one. He, wa he, he, he wants the, the equipment and the software that will let him do what he likes to do better and faster. Game designers often like organized board game nights or outings to the movies. So these are things you can do to help motivate your folks and motivate yourself. We appreciate working within structures that keeps everybody informed and in the loop. And all of us enjoy working on a kick-ass team where everybody is working on the game and aren't, aren't so concerned with personalities or anything else. It's where the game is the thing. That's why we're here. So your goal in seeking these intrinsic rewards is to become what is known as an autotelic person. The word comes from the combination of auto, meaning self, and telic, which means goal. In other words, you want to become someone who sets their own goals and is motivated from within to reach them. Such a person doesn't need many material possessions and probably doesn't care much about power or fame or accumulating vast sums of money or having the corner office or having the best title in the, in the company. An autotelic person is much more likely to be creative than somebody who is concerned with threats or re extrinsic rewards from the outside. So our next step 
is to move between different physical environments in which you can be creative. Some kinds of creativity require being in different places in order to be effective. Sometimes of cri some kinds of creativity call for being alone, being uh, solitary, where you have time for reflection, time for the pieces to kind of reassemble themselves, time for the big picture to emerge. At times like that, you need a place to be alone, where the noise can drop away so that you can hear the voice in your head again. For this kind of creative task, you want ideally an office with a door that you can close. Or if you're in a bullpen environment, that's where you want those noise-canceling headphones where you can kind of close out the world and just concentrate on what you're doing. You might also just want to go for a walk. No matter where I go as a consultant, I travel uh, around the world, obviously I'm here. Um, and no matter where I go, I always find what some, some private space where I can do this kind of work. There are parking lots in Albany, New York, and Los Angeles that right now I could walk around blindfold because the offices there don't have any small conference rooms or anything, and the only way I can get time by myself is to go out in the parking lot and just walk the perimeter and just keep walking and just be by myself until the answers start to come to me. I've done good work in closets, in stairwells, sitting in rental cars, and hiding out in bathroom stalls. You have to find your spot. But there's a different kind of creativity that's sort of the idea popping lightning exchange of you know, minds at work. This is when we like to bounce ideas off of each other and contribute, find out that what everybody has to contribute ends up being something that's much cooler than any of us would have dreamed up on our own. And so bullpens and open office plans often provide this kind of creativity, uh, this uh, creative atmosphere, and they also get points for improving teamwork and, and also accountability. But the best places offer all, the best offices offer all kinds of these spaces. Places where you can be alone, places where you can mingle, places where you can collaborate intensive, uh, intensively, and places that encourage uh, random encounters. Steve Jobs was famous for designing the Pixar, Pixar offices so that anybody who wanted to go to the bathroom, to go to the restroom, had to pass a 